Good Saturday morning to everybody and welcome to Mortgage Matters Radio Show and the Connecticut Real Estate Edge Podcast along with Rob Weinberg. I'm Gary Byron. Well, Rob, how are you this morning? All right. Morning? How you doing, Gary? Uh, you know, I'm not too shabby. I'm getting by. You Good. Know, take it one day at a time. You, you know. got to these days. Oh, my goodness. Yeah, I was going to say, a day in the life of anybody who works in real estate, not just a, a, you know, a mortgage advisor, but a, a real estate attorney, a real estate agent, mm-hmm. um, it, it's, it's, it's tough. What, yes. um, I don't know what I was going to ask you. I waited all week to ask you this. Uh, mortgage rates. I heard they were going to go up again, but they didn't. Uh, now, right, is that stayed. just temporary or? They're saying, I mean, you take what the Fed says with a grain of salt, because if you look at what they said a year, two, three years ago, nothing they said was real. Nothing they said came true. So you have to take their predictions with, a, you know, a lot of uh, just with a grain of salt. Right. Yes, they did pause raising rates. Great. First time they've paused in a couple years now. So. Definitely a step in the right direction, but they made clear that they don't plan on stopping. They do plan to continue raising the rates, you know, in other meetings this year. And they uh, predicted that the federal funds rate, you know, which is the rate they control, was going to be like half a point higher than it is right now by the end of the year. That means they're factoring in one to two additional rate hikes. So when, if they do this, I shouldn't even say when, but it sounds like if. Yeah. Oh, not, not if. It sounds, it sounds like if. It, it sounds like when. when. And yeah. that's what they're saying, but obviously a lot can change, right? When are you hearing that they may start going the other direction? You know, I listen to a lot of different channels when it comes to mortgage advice, um, market advice, interest rate, rhetoric, e- economics, things like that. So, And I try to diversify where I'm getting information because nobody's right. I, I've yeah. come to that conclusion. Nobody's right. And there's some sources. I pay a lot of money to get access to some of these economists and mortgage uh, masters, so to speak, right? But with that said, they haven't been completely right. Like maybe they're sometimes right, sometimes wrong, like mm-hmm. a weatherman, mm-hmm. right? So I try to take in all the information and then make my own decisions and my own Uh, really my own advice that I can give my clients that's very customized to them. So really a a major uh, a major hurdle that we've had since the beginning of the year is that people have been saying the rates were going to go down. Right. We've been hearing that, hey, they hit this really high level in November of 2022 and now they're going to come down. And they did start going down earlier this year. You know, early 2023, we saw a nice reduction in interest rates. But 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 by March or April, they had popped right back. And here we are, June of 2023. And the are very close, if not right where they were at those all-time highs, or not all-time, recent highs in November of 22. I'm telling my clients, be prepared to wait one to three years for rates to come down, okay? Could it happen later this year, early next year? Absolutely, and I pray that it will. But I feel a lot of certainty in talking in a one- to three-year timeline because someone that's taking a 30-year fixed mortgage with maybe a payment higher than they would be comfortable with, if they can stomach that, if they have the reserves and the income to pay that for one to three years, knowing that there is a refinance opportunity at that point, maybe it'll save you $100 a month, maybe it'll save you $400 a month. I don't know those variables, but it's just when we look at the ebb and flow of the economy and the cycles, you know, hopefully we're close to that top and we're going to start seeing that down. Well, if it went down slightly last November in the, only to go back up again, maybe this November it'll go down temporarily. It's, I mean, just... the thing is, Gary, it's not even about the rates going up and down. It's about what drives that. There's a lot of forward looking things that drive that. So it's what is the federal funds rate going to be? Is the Fed going to raise rates? If people really think that they are, mortgage rates will react by going up. If they think we've hit peak inflation and are going down, mortgage rates will follow that and go down. So mortgage rates follow inflation. They don't follow that federal funds rate. And it's not only about what inflation is now, it's about what's the outlook for inflation over the next several years. That idea right there can change literally on the drop of a dime. And there were times in the last month where on a Monday we thought rates weren't going any higher. Then on Tuesday, some news report came out, the entire thing shifted, and rates went up a quarter point in one day. You know, so it's these news events. There's so much uncertainty that these little blips, these, you know, one thing from Europe and another piece of news from Japan, and then, Mm. oh, U.S. is coming out with this. It all, it's a global economy now. 10, 15 years ago, the rate in Europe didn't matter as much now it does many people think that the interest rates on mortgages 
are tied to when the Fed goes up in their mm-hmm. rate. But they're actually two very different. Yeah, they're not tied to it at all. The, the mortgage rates are tied to inflation. And where's inflation going to be going? When inflation's going up, mortgage rates are soaring, as we but see. But the Fed does the same thing, though. The-, the Fed, though, the Fed is looking at a lot of data that is old data. Meaning by the time the Fed gets it, that's from a month or two ago, right? So they're trying to make decisions today based on data from one to two months back. And unfortunately, the Fed always overdoes it, which they're doing this time. So they're going to overdo it. And we're going to have to play the game again about ratcheting down the rates. (laughs) But that doesn't mean the rates are going to three or four. So don't hold your breath. Um, a major a major hurdle a lot of people are having nowadays is having that low rate on their current home, right? And then selling that home and buying a new one at a higher rate. We've talked about that so much. Yeah. And I've had a lot of inquiries, really, especially over the last few months, people see those real estate values keep going up and go, gosh, I know I'm going to give up that rate, <laughs> but I really need to get a new property. And then they have the conundrum of simultaneously buying and selling a home. It can be difficult it can be stressful it can be impossible yeah gary you're one of those you know looking at that scenario so what i wanted to do was an entire episode for the people that are trying to either sell a primary home sell an investment Mm. property sell some sort of property that they own and because they need to they need to use that money to buy another property maybe they don't qualify with both maybe they need the money for the down payment maybe it's just a change in lifestyle or a downgrade or a downsize whatever it may be So many right now trying to do this simultaneously, buying and selling. There are tips and tricks. There are techniques. There are things that I've learned doing this specific type of transaction. I don't have an exact number, but I'll say I've probably done somewhere around 80 to 100 of these simultaneous buy and sell transactions. So I know what derails them. I also know what makes them go really, really smooth. And I wanted to, you know, really uncover all that for all of our listeners, whether you're working with me, another lender, another realtor, whatever, just take what we're saying, use that to educate yourself, use the knowledge to make your process a lot easier. And maybe you're on the sideline and listening to today's show, you'd say, I can do this. This makes sense. Now that I have that knowledge, I'm empowered to go do this thing and we'll help you through it. I'm going to ask you some questions that that I uh, This doesn't happen every show. Right. I actually may know some of the answers to some of the questions I'm going to ask you. Why? No, I'm no real estate advisor guru. It's because I'm going through it right now and have been going through it. I've actually been looking at a home for about a year and a half and I've been getting really serious about it. Um, Maybe since the beginning of this year, since January of 2023. Um, But let's start with some of the main challenges that people face when they're trying to buy and sell, or maybe I should sell, say, sell and buy uh, a home. Right. So main challenges. So when we just surface level, say, sell and buy, right? Where does your mind go? It goes to, okay, well, how am I going to do that? The dates? How am I going to sell that and buy another? Where am I going to go? Where am I going to stay? The Where's my stuff gonna Where go going to go during that time, right? So what are the challenges? Like, let's break it down. Number one, coordinating timelines between both closings. Number two is managing the financing, the mortgage. How long is that going to take? How, how can we make sure it's going to be ready by the time it needs to be ready? Dealing with the stress of coordinating all of the different realtors, attorneys, home inspectors, appraisers, all that for both transactions. It requires careful planning. It requires careful coordination. This is one of those cases where having that foundational wealth team we've talked about so many times, having that cohesive unit that's like backing you up as a home buyer and as a home seller to make sure every detail is ironed out, this is the transaction where it's going to pay for itself many, many times over having that unit. If you try to wing it by either coordinating this all yourself or having inexperienced or just incompetent people working with you, you're going to have a lot of stress. And a lot of the times these just don't close on time. You know, there, there's a delay here or there, and that does add stress too. So I'm happy to say that there's ways to do this to where you can close both transactions on the same day. Uh, you can ch- close one on a Monday, another on a Tuesday. There's a lot of different ways but to you're, do that's it. That's providing you even have found the house that you want to move into. Yeah. Now, that's that's obviously one of the dilemmas, especially today with the limited inventory. But we're going to assume, for the purposes of our show, wow. that you at least have found an area that you want to live and it's move into. It's a big into. assumption. But I'll, for the sake of the show, I, I, how can someone determine, though, 
if they're financially prepared for the juggling act of buying and selling at the same time. So a big thing that happens to me as a mortgage advisor is that I'll get a call from someone who's looking to buy a new home. They've, they've determined that they want to buy something new. They haven't figured out, do I need to sell this house or can I keep this house that I have now? Is there a workaround, right? So we'll do some fact-finding and we'll do some strategizing to figure that out. We need to assess your financial situation. Where's your credit at? Mm-hmm. I had someone come to me, wanted to do this. We ran their credit nowhere near close to qualifying for a mortgage, like way, way out. So they can't do this, right? They're not going to be selling and buying. They might be selling and renting. They might be selling and going living with family, right? But they're not selling and buying. So the sooner you can figure out your particular strategy, the better. Um, Savings. What's your savings situation look like? Can you even afford to move and put the initial deposits down? Or is all your money tied up in your current home, like every dime? We need to know that to see how to structure the transaction. Where's your income at? Income stability. I've had people try to do this where, again, maybe their credit's great, but they just retired. And they don't have you know, a lot of income. Maybe they have a pension starting in three months and they have Social Security. Well, that probably isn't going to qualify for your mortgage in this economy, in this market. So with this client I'm thinking of, we had to get a cosigner. So there it was a workaround. But like... Figure that out out up front. Let's not wait till you're like in a contract. So this evaluation is very important. We got to have a clear understanding of what your budget is and the potential costs that you're going to have for both selling your current property and buying the new one. You may think I don't have enough money, but when we look at your 401ks, your savings, your uh, investments, you have an option. You can keep this home because you have enough in savings and investments to put down on a new home and you can qualify for both properties. So sometimes it's, hey, you've got choices. Sometimes it's flexible. Other times it's not. It's no way, no how. But you may not qualify for the same amount. Yeah. So one of the benefits, not to get too in the weeds here, but with certain loans, we can offset your current mortgage by using proposed rental income. So if you're going to keep your current home as a rental, we can actually offset your new mortgage by the amount on that rental. So for some people, again, they might think I can't afford two mortgages. There's no way. But as a creative advisor that knows the guidelines, we might be able to say, hey, wait, if you rent your current property for 1500 a month, you would cancel out the current mortgage payment that you have. And that mortgage would be paid by the tenants. Hmm, for a new landlord, they may go, wow, I haven't thought of it that way, right? I didn't realize that I could have the tenant pay my mortgage because they haven't done it before. So that, yes, you have to qualify with both if you're keeping both, but there are ways, you know, to do that. You need to figure out if you have those other funds or not. For most people, that's what it comes down to. Can you qualify for both mortgages? Do you have the money to put down without selling? And based on the answers to those questions, we can determine if you need to sell to buy or if you have that flexibility. How about some specific, I don't know, timelines or strategies maybe to to ensure a smooth uh, uh, you know, transition between buying and selling? Where a lot of people get into a major speed bump in these transactions is setting unrealistic timelines. Maybe it's the realtor's. Maybe it's an attorney, you know, maybe it's the lender that just doesn't understand the transaction and what it takes. But you want to establish realistic timelines with everyone. So everyone knows, hey, here's what we can expect for getting an appraisal. Here's what we can expect for getting our loan commitment. Here's when we can look at closing and ensuring that those transactions, the selling and the buying are in line with each other. Right. So for most people, that looks like the same day, closing and buying on the same day or back to back. So closing on a Thursday on the sale, then the Friday, the next day, the buy, the, you know, the next uh, property. So it's usually one of those two ways. If things get derailed, you might be closing on one. And what do you do for a week or two? Right. That's the dilemma. That's why you want to do this up front. So you don't have that lull in between. Okay, so having your specifically your mortgage advisor coordinate with your real estate agent is going to be the most important collaboration because the real estate agent is generally going to be the one that finalizes dates in the contract. And if they screw up a date, you're going to have to go back and ask for an extension or things like that. So all professionals involved need to know what's going on. You want to have contingency plans in place like temporary housing. What if there is that lull of a few days? Can you stay with family? Do you have a place to put your stuff like a storage unit? Even if you think you might not need it, 
make a contingency plan. Make a plan B. You're going to sleep better at night by doing that. Also, when a challenge or a, a delay comes up, you won't be scrambling, right? You're not going to be worried because, oh, we, this is what they told us to do. You know, this is why we did that uh, planning ahead of time, just in case. Again, I'm proud to say that the, the transactions are smooth. You know, buying and selling most of the time happens on the same day. And it's smooth and easy if it's done the, with these right tips and tricks that we're talking about. How do you leverage, though, your, your current home's equity to, in order to facilitate the purchase of a new one? Right. So like we were just talking about, the major reason why people sell a home to buy a new one is because of their cash position, meaning they don't have enough money to put down on the new one without selling the old one. If you are proactive in your thoughts, if you're someone that's been listening to our show a while and are really strategizing well ahead of time like we talk about doing, then you can explore options like home equity lines of credit. Um, You can explore options like cash out refinancing. When we've got like 6, 12, 18 months till you need the money, there's a lot of different ways to liquidate equity out of your home. When we're in the moment and it's, hey, I need the money from here to get here, well, then you're kind of limited to bridge loans, um, which are few and far between, high interest, higher risk, making a contingent offer where you have to put an offer and say, well, I can only buy your house if I sell mine. And in today's market... It's hard enough, right? Mm -hmm. So to say I can only buy your house if I sell mine, you're not completely ruining your chances, but you're moving your offer to the lower priority when it comes to multiple offer situations. So, you know, those strategies like the home equity lines and cash out refis and all that, they can provide that at least temporary financial solution until the current home is sold because you don't have to sell it to buy a new one. Um, But just keep in mind, these are going to provide, you know, require forethought. These are going to require a long-term plan. These aren't going to be something that you're going to do in the midst of a transaction because a home equity loan or cash out refi could take three, four, five weeks. Folks, you are listening to Mortgage Matters Radio Show and the Connecticut Real Estate Age Podcast. You can contact Rob very easily. Write this phone number down. It's 860-413-3938. Repeat that number, give you the website, give you his email address, uh, in a little bit, um, along with Rob Weinberg, I'm Gary Byron. All right, let's talk about maybe some some financing options if you're doing both, if you're trying to sell your home and purchase a home here. Yeah, so generally speaking, you would qualify for a conventional or a government mortgage like the ones we've talked about. Uh, again, contingent on the sale of your current home. But if you're trying to you know, really mitigate all the risks we're talking about, I would say number one is look at options for bridge loans um, that can kind of bridge the gap between what you have available and what you need to buy that next property. That'll give you a more, um, just really a better offer, an offer that they want to accept because they see, oh, he doesn't need to sell that other home. So that's a big one. Then another one, which I've been using uh, lately with some clients, is extended rate locks. So generally, when you lock your rate in, it's going to be like a 30 to 60 day rate lock. That's usually how we do it. That's going to give you the best rate, the best price. But if you're in a situation where you're trying to sell your home and buy a new one, maybe you're in a position where it could take you a lot longer to Mm. either sell or buy, right? Either one could be a longer process than you expect or you hope. Well, with an extended rate lock, we can, instead of just locking your rate for 30, or 60 days, we can lock your rate up to six months. Okay. Yes, there's upfront fees to do that. It's not free. Uh, And many lenders do offer the extended rate locks. But if you're someone who's concerned about rates going up and you're concerned about your timeline, then an extended rate lock, it might be worth the upfront cost. You know, we have to look at it on a deal by deal basis because, again, the cost can be pretty substantial to do that extended rate lock. It's definitely something, though, to consider because it may help you sleep better at night knowing my rates locked in while the Fed keeps raising. Right. Give me some. Give me more potential risks, or I don't know, pitfalls that can occur. You got to. You got to yeah. know the risks and pitfalls because I've seen them, and if you don't, you could fall oh, into the trap. I'm sure the uh, the financial strain that can come from doing one of these simultaneous transactions, and for a lot of people, it's like the deposits that they need to put. So when you're buying a home, you're generally going to put like a good faith deposit up front just to say, "Hey, I want to buy your home. Here's five thousand. Here's ten thousand. Right, just as an initial deposit." Um, if you haven't sold your home and you're cash flow not in a great spot, how are you going to come up with an initial deposit, right? Mm -hmm. If you need $5,000 and your savings is sitting at $2,800, how are you going to come up with that? It can create a lot of financial strain. 
it's something that we need to talk about because you can't just pull money from anywhere or get money from Uncle Joe. We need to discuss, as your mortgage advisors, we need to know where that money's coming from. But as you can imagine, that can create stress because not only are you trying to buy and sell and do all this at once, but now where am I going to get the couple grand I need to do it? And then during the transaction, you got to pay for appraisals. Where am I going to come up with the 500 to $900, depending on the property, to pay for that appraisal? For some, it may not be a big deal, but for people that are living paycheck to paycheck uh, in not a great financial situation, that five to eight hundred dollars, nine hundred dollars, that can mean the difference between buying a home inspection or not. Inspection too, right? Inspection costs. Yeah, there's all those upfront costs that will have to be paid before you sell your home, right? So that's number one. Next thing is timing challenges. We've been just reiterating the timing of selling a home and buying one at the same time. There's a lot of coordination that needs to be done. There's a lot of communication that needs to be done. And that, to me, is the most important thing, is having all of the parties communicating on an ongoing basis. And then last thing is going to be unexpected market fluctuations. Now, this could mean the real estate market might change. It could mean interest rates might change. Go talk to someone that worked with a home builder a year ago to build a home and you know, is now or only in the last few months now locking their interest rate in. They might be in a really difficult financial situation. They might have been getting a five and a half percent rate a year ago, and now they're getting six and a half or seven. So those are risks. You always talk about the communication between your team, right? So how can someone effectively coordinate with your real estate agent, your lender, and some of these other professionals, your attorney, that are also involved in the transaction? Right. So the way I look at the transaction myself is I'm the quarterback, you know, as the mortgage advisor, I'm the guy running the show with communication because I'm making sure that the bank documents, the money is where it needs to be. So because I'm controlling the money, I also need to make sure everyone else knows what's going on with the money. So I'm coordinating between both agents, the real estate attorneys and all that, at least to get the ball rolling. Okay, once the ball is rolling, then they can obviously talk amongst themselves. But I would say the biggest advice would be to figure out what type of communication people prefer. Like attorneys may not text, but realtors might love texting. Attorney might only respond to email, but not a phone call, whereas a realtor might only respond to a text or a phone call. So you need to figure out from each party in the transaction, what are their hours? When can they be reached? How do they want to be communicated with? What do they prefer? And then communicate in that way. Regular updates are, are very, very important. So like on my end, I am talking at least once a week to everyone in the transaction, even if it's just to say, hey, we're on track for closing on June 30th. Here's what happened this week. When a week goes by and you don't hear, people start wondering, wait, what's going on? Did yeah. something happen? What's the So you got to keep that. Now, some lenders will do an email to everyone. Some will do a phone call. I prefer a phone call, um, especially if it's something that needs to be tackled. It's good to collaborate. So those are some things that you can do to coordinate. Any advice that you can give to someone maybe who needs to sell their current home quickly while still searching for a new one? Yeah, well, the timing is crucial. So selling a home quickly, it's going to be working closely with realtors that know the market. Definitely meet with at least two to three realtors to make sure that you've got one that will represent you well, that you mesh with on a personality level, and that has the experience. Uh, Experience for me in real estate is the most important thing right now because we're in such a volatile market. A lot of people haven't seen this before. And if you have a realtor that has only been in a short time, meaning less than a couple of years, they may not have seen and know how to navigate this market with you. So work closely and then figure out decisively, here's the one that I'm going to work with. And you know, work with them closely to make sure that they list your home competitively to sell quickly. You want to be a little bit more flexible with timelines, deadlines, and even the property you're buying because you have a short timeline. You can't get every bell and whistle. You can't get every single thing you want in a home. You might be able to get close, but be more flexible with all that, knowing that you're, you know, you're up against the clock. You've got the deadline. And of course, you want to work, especially with the attorneys, to coordinate the funds transfer. So something that we haven't mentioned that's very technical is the process of the money going from an attorney that's selling your home to the attorney who's helping you buy a new home. In a perfect world, it'd be the same attorney, but a lot of time it isn't, and they have to transact with each other. The money has to get transferred from one attorney to another, sometimes the same day, so that it's there for your next closing. Have you ever had a client say, listen, I've got a significant amount of money in the bank. Um, I don't want to deplete it, because uh, there's going to be closing costs, and right. you, you, an emergency can come up with your new tires, or whatever. Unforeseen. Um, 
I'm willing to put fifty or sixty thousand down right now, but once I sell my home, I want to take a oh, hundred thousand, hundred and fifty thousand, whatever from that and add that to it. But at that point in time, I would have already have closed and I'll already be in the new house. So here's fifty or sixty now I'll put down on it. And then once I sell my home, I'm going to give you another, I don't know, let's keep the numbers easy, another $100,000. So assume, yes, you can do that. What is that First called? of all, assuming that you need, or assuming that you can qualify for both homes, right? That's what you're assuming, that you can buy the new one before selling if you have the extra 50000 in the bank. Yeah. What you're referring to can be done one of two ways. It can either be done what's called a recast, a recast where you send the money into the lender, they re-amortize the loan and drop your payment based on the new principal balance. That's what's obviously most common right now. But in most normal markets, we're in a stable to decreasing rate environment. A refinance would also be a good strategy for that. That quickly? Generally refinancing minimum of six to 12 months after you buy the home. So I would tell you if you're my client, you know, let's look at the timing. Can we time it to where it would be six to 12 months after you buy the home? Then we can look at a refinance. Otherwise, definitely a recast. In 20 seconds. Any success stories or examples of clients who successfully Recent mastered Recent clients this? just up the road here in oh, Windsor. Oh. Literally in the last couple of weeks, we went through this exact thing. They literally came to me, their agent, I should say, who I've worked with close, came to me and said, Rob, last minute, found this guy's dream home, wasn't planning on it. We're listing his home this weekend to sell. Like he me. had to sell to buy. So... It all came together so quick. Now, first of all, the guy came to me early, early in the process, and we got lucky. He had excellent credit, lots of assets, solid income, multiple properties, A-plus buyer. So that helped. Listing agent got his property fixed up, ready to go. Within one week, it was on the market for sale. Within three days, it actually sold well above list price for way more than he thought, took that money, and then put it towards the next house. Outstanding. Folks, if you like uh, more information on this show or any of the others that we do uh, and broadcast every weekend, simply head on over to Rob's website. It's www.robgw.com. Again, robgw.com. Hey, shoot him an email or shoot us an email. We'll try to get it answered right here on these very airwaves, maybe as soon as even next weekend. It's simply Mortgage Matters Radio Show at gmail.com and to schedule that appointment, that oh, that consultation that's so important, 860-413-3938. Again, 860-413-3938. For Rob Weinberg, I'm Gary Byron. Thank you so much for listening to Mortgage Matters Radio Show and the Connecticut Real Estate Edge Podcast. Until next Saturday morning, have a good one, everybody. So long.